So now we're going to talk about Romans chapter 5. And if you're just jumping in listening to this, I recommend you go back and listen to Romans 4. If you have a spare hour. If you have or a spare hour. 30 minutes at double speed. Yes. Yes. So we're going to be, we're continuing on our conversation about faith. Yes. Faith. That's right. We've been talking about Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith. Yes. And N.T. Wright, he actually describes this chapter as that he says that Paul is talking about a reconciliation to end all rec- reconciliations. I like it. Yep. Yeah. One that brings about it all. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let's see where he goes with that. And I'll just add this part. He also says, having laid the foundation in chapters one to four, Paul is beginning to build the structure, a picture of Christian life in which all the ancient promises of God are coming true. At the center of these promises is the establishment of a loving, welcoming personal relationship between individual humans and the creator God himself. I like it. I yeah. should just read his whole book. You should just read the book. It might just and there sound he is. I mean, one of the me. arguments that's often leveled against T. Wright by Reformed theologians is that he dismisses personal salvation too much. But that sounded like that's exactly what it was. I mean, it's the yes. the foundation is the word he used, and then he builds on it to say it's all this corporate um, results of it. But it starts as a foundation of personal salvation. Yeah, yeah. He also says this here: we make the mistake of thinking God is like us. Mm. And that we can't fathom how a God would be able to individually care for and consider one human in billions or be able to care for billions. He is the creator of the world, transcendent over and above his creation. And yet, because his very nature is love, it is, as we might say, completely natural for him to establish personal one-to-one relations with every single one of us. In other words, he, he could not do that. Yes. Even though we might think that, how would God do that? The very nature of love demands that he would be able to do that. Yeah. would be able to interact with each of us personally. It's a strange concept of this God. Like if you were going to invent a God, what would he be like? He'd be like me. Or she. Or she. They'd be like me. Like you? That's what idolatry is. Yeah. <laughs> we create gods in our own image. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'd probably have a lot more judgy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm kind of getting at. <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Are you saying I'm with, judgy? No, I'm saying I would create a God like that. I would create a, I would create a God that thinks and thinks and does things the way I think and do things uh, or the way I think and exactly. think should right. be said and done. Yeah, I get that. And our God's very different to that. Yes. By his grace. Thank God for that because otherwise we we would destroy the world. Yes, because because I quite I know myself quite well, I'm quite glad to read that N.T. Wright says here that God is nothing like me. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and we should just n- mention there, this is what makes the God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, different. I I love reading Greek mythology. If you pick up and read, because it's the contemporaneous religion of the time that Christianity is birthed, that Paul is writing this, and the gods are just like humans. They're capricious. They're angry with each other. They're fighting with each other. They're vying for power and all kinds of crazy stuff. That is, our God is so different to that. So that's a classic example of what happens when you create gods in your own image rather than recognize that we have been created in God's image. Yeah. Right, because there's no way, I was going to say no way in hell. I shouldn't say those things on these No way in Hades. We're just about Greek mythology. Yeah, that I would ever create a God who created humans and the world and then they stuff it up and then I would make so much effort to bring them back to me, close to me, forgive them over and over and over again and then create this elaborate, amazing, succinct plan that would redeem them and then redeem and restore humanity all at once, and creation, I would never do that. <laughs> Go back and listen to that again, folks. That was 35, 40 seconds of gold. Oh, that, that's so lovely that, that, that you said so that. That was so good. That is such a good example of the difference between us and God and why in the previous chapter, David goes, oh, the joys of one who've been saved and sins are forgiven because that is a revelation you've just given of the incredible grace of God. That's so lovely. Cheer, uh, give you an applause for saying that to me. That's <laughs> no, I don't deserve one. <laughs> I that cheers you, you with my drink. No, uh, cheers. My cheers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> with my water bottle. Yeah. So I'm going to say this statement here. It's not my statement. It's Paul's statement. It's verse number one. Verse one. Okay. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him. I mean, that's extraordinary. Why would he do that? Anyway, we have it all. We have it all mm. together with God because of our master Jesus we have it all. Did you just see that? Yeah, see we have that says it that? all. Yep, Christ has, uh, yeah, exactly. It doesn't quite say the word all here, but it's the same thing. Christ has brought into a place of deserved privilege where we now stand. Yeah. Everything. And so to add on to my statement about what 
differences between the God I would make and the God of this Bible is he also gives me, gives you so much. Yes. Multiple gifts, blessings, gift of life itself, I suppose. Yeah. But like all of these things. All of this amazing, gracious gift from a generous God who continually loves us despite our willfulness and yeah. wandering. And not because of anything we've done, but because here God has always wanted to do for us. Mm. Chosen. Chosen. As we talked about last episode. And that's not all. It continues on. <laughs> Flick, the page. Flick those pages. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door, open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we are, always where we are. I can't even read. We're only done an hour into this and I can't even <laughs> read or talk. I even said that sentence wrong. <laughs> okay. We find ourselves standing out where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. Beautiful. What does that mean? The wide open spaces of God's grace. Oh, I love the way you ask those deep questions. Because I wonder what... Uh, I wonder what Eugene Peterson thought when he wrote that, the wide open spaces of God's grace. I think he's talking about a vastness. You know, you talked about in the last end of the last episode about how we can take salvation and water it down to just, oh, I'm saved now, I can do whatever. But I think what he's indicating there is there's so much more than that. The wide open spaces means the grace of God is transcendent. There is such a rich life. Think of a picture of green pastures. There's place to run. There's place for shade. There's place for sun. There's place to enjoy all the beautiful things of life. That's what's made available to us through grace, by faith in Christ. So in our last chapter, we talked about the words believe, faith, trust. Mm -hmm. Now we have this new word. Grace. Grace. Yeah, okay. So that comes into the into it at this point, yeah. Look at all those good things. Yeah. Believe, trust, grace. Yeah, that's it. Yep, grace is a big theme. Why are we so special to God? Because he loves us. I know it's an oversimplistic answer, but that's the simplest answer. Who are we, Psalm 8? Who are we that you've chosen us, that you care for us? But that's the beautiful thing about God's grace. He just has, despite how screwed up we are. Continuing on here. Mm -hmm. That was a good answer, by the way. Three to five, there's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patient in turn Patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. What is Paul talking about here? Because as far as I knew growing up, Christianity was to embrace suffering, like to love the suffering, to... You know that we've talked about. You're a real Christian if you suffer. Yeah, real Christian if you suffer. Okay. This this idea that God is generously pouring something into our lives through the Holy Spirit. What what is that? If I'm right in this passage of Scripture, I think the way from memory, the way Paul writes this is it's a sequential argument. One thing builds to another thing builds to another thing. So the reason we can rejoice in problems and trials is because they develop endurance and develop. The reason that what in develop endurance does is it builds character and character brings us a confident faith or a hope in salvation. And that's what doesn't disappoint it. So he's using a four, 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 four argument all the way through. It's like he's nesting the argument. And so I think what you're saying there is that you, the belief is, oh, well, I'm, when I'm suffering, that's a real Christian thing to do. I think probably that's just stopping at step one a little bit. It's true. I mean, Christians suffer, but Paul's trying to say the reason we can rejoice in suffering is because of this sequential argument that that begins a process when we activate faith that ultimately leads to this confident hope that we can experience God's goodness and this green open, wide open green pastures, even though we're suffering. So I'd say you've had part of it, but you probably, if that was the teaching you'd grown up with, valid and important, but probably stopped short of the whole process. And I would say having rate been grown up as a Pentecostal, we probably skipped the suffering bit as if to say, well, if you're suffering, you're not really in faith and went straight to the end of the process. So I would argue that we need to probably dovetail those two perspectives together into one. Doesn't that, or isn't that what a lot of people say, if you're not healed in this miracle, that you have a problem with faith? Yeah, I think that's, well, that's certainly the perspective that I would have been exposed to more than maybe you did in the 
in a Baptist environment where it was probably more around the flagellation perspective. But as a Pentecostal, that was the other extreme. Yeah, you didn't have enough faith. Whereas you just read it there. Paul's going, hey, you're going to face problems and trials. You're going to face suffering. James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials and tribulations of every kind because you know, he also says, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So he does the same argument as Paul does here. So don't separate out the reality of sufferings for the Christian, but don't limit yourself to realizing that the sufferings themselves make you somehow a more holy Christian. No, the sufferings are a result of faith that if you weather them well and weather them in faithfulness, they will bring about a beautiful result in your life and through your life. That's what we hope for. That's what we hope for. And that's what Paul's saying. He calls it confident hope. Yeah. Yes. I I actually just got um, stuck or struck rather by what you were saying there. And I went off on multiple tangents, so I'm going to bring it back. But we won't do that. No. (laughs) Where was I? About verse six, I think. Yeah. I wrote it. Yes. Verse verse five you commented on. I wrote here a note to myself in the Bible. Person should praise though we're in trouble. Praise him though we're in trouble. Mm. That is, um, if you're praising him when you're in trouble, that is being active in your faith, isn't it? Yeah, that's it's that believing, active trust. It's trusting and it's um, experiencing or living in the grace. It's choosing it? to believe that I will see God's goodness even though I may not see a breakthrough on the outside. I'm just right. choosing to believe God is still good and I trust him with my, with the ultimate plan, the cosmic plan and my part in it. Okay. We're going to get to the cosmic plan. We are. So in verses 6 to 8, Christ arrived on time to make this happen. Just the right time. Because he just mentioned the Holy Spirit which he hadn't yep, mentioned Romans before, five. No, he brings, brings the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit here. So he's starting this uh, theology of the triune God, isn't he? He's introducing this uh, in a new way. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think through previous chapters to see if Certainly it's Certainly later on, he, he brings what it he up says later. is yeah. different. Is this the start of what he – yeah, I don't know. not sure if this is the start of it, but it's certainly here. The concept of the role of the Spirit – and of Christ and the Father is here very clearly in these passages. Yeah, okay. So Christ arrived to make this happen on time. He said, he didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. Now, if you had not read anything about the, this faith before, what is he talking about? What is sacrificial death? What's going on? Big question. He, in, and say it in a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> that he's trying to show that Christ's love is so extravagant that before or before we did anything to earn the results of that death, the benefits of that death, God had already sent his son and Christ died while we were still sinners, while we were still estranged from him. That sh- he's basically trying to show this wonderful grace of God that didn't wait for anything. It's back to the last chapter. He chose us before we chose him. And that's what Christ did. But that's why do we into. need a sacrificial death? Uh, I see. You've got to go back. If you're bu- building Paul's argument here, you're going back on chapters one, two, and three, especially where he's showing the problem of sin that leads to death. And he's saying all humans, Jews and Gentiles, all of us are trapped under this problem of sin. All have sinned, 323, and fallen short of God's glory. So there's all of this whole concept of every one of us is in this boat where sin and death are our lot. And we could not get ourselves out of that. So Jesus, while we were still against an enemy of God, while we were still living in our sin, he did something about it. That's why we need it because we cannot we cannot defeat sin and death on our own. We needed God to do something about it for us. Do you think the idea of the sacrifice is that from God or from humans? You said you didn't want to go deep. <laughs> you Was want to that get into the atonement theology? <laughs> no. Who who started that idea? Okay. Well, I think biblically, I think if you asked a Jewish rabbi biblically who started the idea of sacrifice they would take you back to Genesis 3 where God killed the first lamb and covered over Adam and Eve with the skins of those lambs. I think that's where they would say the concept of sacrifice. Was that a lamb? I always saw it as a like a tiger a ram, or something. A ram, I think it says. 
Were maybe he clothed just to them? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I always saw it as a tiger. They were walking around. In yeah, like, a tiger. <laughs> yeah. You've got me. You've got or me. Or a leopard. Have we just automatically assumed that it's one or the other. Let me see. I don't think it says, does it? I don't know. It maybe depends. that's that's one of those ones where you might just take it for granted. He says, "The Lord God made clothing from animal skin skins for Adam and his wife." Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're right. So it could have been any kind of animal skin. Because the lamb is later on with Abraham. Well, yeah, maybe that's why Isaac. the implication comes in that there's this. But yeah, you're right. Maybe I, mean, I have imposed, not maybe. So you've I, always seen Adam and Eve in lion in lamb skins. Yeah, that's I have. Sweet, like like <laughs> UGG shoes. You're Ugg thinking boots or like to, you're thinking them like you know tiger clothes yes. or something. Yes, like, like uh, j- Tarzan leopard skin. Tarzan, like Tarzan, Tarzan yeah. and Jane <laughs> probably fits. Anyway, there you go. It's a little moment of, of shows you how you just build up an argument and just read something a hundred times and never see it. Never thought I would have seen something in Genesis 3 that I'd never seen before. Spend so much time in there. So, One would hope it wouldn't be pig skins because they're quite – Yeah, well, the fur is that, not that, would, very nice. that would be very nice, would it? So with all of that in mind, it, that's what a Jewish rabbi would say, that God first um, caused – or he basically allowed an animal to die in place of – Adam and Eve, and that is the first sacrifice. Of course, I think where you might have been going is that later on, humans throughout history. I have, have never thought of that in context with being the first sacrifice. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's how the rabbis saw it. Yeah. That God was so angry at them, he had to kill this animal rather uh, than God decided he had already decided to clothe them because of their shame. Um, I think it's a bit of both. I wouldn't say it's God is angry at them, so he has to kill an animal. I think that's where we get to this wrathful, vengeful God thing. Or they need... They needed to be covered and they were incapable of covering themselves because you remember just before that, they had tried to cover themselves with fig leaves and it was yes. in, it was inadequate, incomplete. Creation has been, at that moment, creation has been subjected to decay, as it says in Romans 8. It was never going to be enough to clothe yourself in fig leaves. And it's it's the narrative is written in such a way to try to help us to see that our best efforts were never going to cover our shame and God didn't leave us there. In his love, he caused another to suffer in our place and he used that suffering to cover our shame. And that's the argument upon which the rest of the concepts of Jewish sacrifice is built, which is very different to pagan sacrifice, where sacrifices was was seen as something that had to happen to appease an angry God or had to be seen to feed the God. Um, self-indulgence and all that sort of stuff. So sac- Jewish sacrifice is always seen as a selfless gift, a loving gift on behalf of ones who didn't deserve it. Oh, wow. I've never seen, never put it in context of Genesis, what, three? Never. Genesis three. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That's just blown everything wide open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in a new way. Yeah. More thinking oh, for you to do. More thinking for you to do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just going to skip over what I was going to say because- now I can't even, I'm so excited about that. I can't okay. even. <laughs> Write it down so you don't forget to study it. <laughs> All right. Where were we? We are talking about sacrificial death. So it yes. seems to be that there is a need. There is a need. An for ancient us. need yes. for a sacrificial death. Yes, that's right. Okay. And that none of the animals that had been put to death for the is the Jews had covered the yep. significance of sin. Yeah. We've just finished the book of Hebrews, which makes that okay. very, very clear. So we can just, we that's can part, the statement. Go back and listen to Hebrews. Yep. Okay. All right, so God put his love on the line by offering his son as the sacrificial death. So this seems to be known by the people reading this letter. They understand that concept more than a person who might pick this up today. Correct. And read that. Okay, so now we are set right with God by means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice. There is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If when we are at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son, now that we're at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of his resurrection life. What? I'm a bit that way too. <laughs> Listening to that. Just think of how our lives will expand and yep. deepen by means of his resurrection life. So um, what what verse does that finish on? Because I think I, I think I know what it's saying. In it's about... It, to almost to 11. Let me just finish it here. Yep. Now that we have actually received this amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it in a plodding prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus, the Messiah. Yep. Okay. So the New Living Translation from verse 8 says, but God has showed his great love for us in sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we couldn't rescue ourselves. And since we've been made, made right with God, 
uh, God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from condemnation. So this is that process again. We didn't deserve it. We were still sinners. We couldn't save ourselves. Christ died in our place and his blood means that that doesn't just forgive us. It means that we have been removed from all condemnation. There is nothing left that can condemn us. That that verse of saving us from God's condemnation will come up again in Romans chapter eight, verse one. So he's going to do what you've been saying and see the thought here and return to it um, in a few chapters time. So I think it's just re- reiterating to us again the magnificent grace of God that has not just covered but fully restored us to the into the story, into the redemptive story. And this mention here of resurrection life, mm. that seems new to me. Seems new to you? Well, in this in the text. Ah, uh, in the text. Uh, yes, I think he's. I don't think he has brought resurrection into the story until this point. He's really only introduced Christ as the. Ep- the solution to the problem um, from chapter three onwards. So yeah, I think maybe that through his resurrection and the implications of his resurrection that we can live this new life, this resurrection life. That's, that, I think that's pretty new to this to this book. Yeah, for probably first time it's mentioned. What does resurrection life mean? I think it's I think it's a very vast thing that we probably can't explain a hundred percent. But if you think about it in terms of say he's teaching around Lazarus and the tomb of Lazarus and so on, it seems to have an implication that. It's more than just somehow coming back to life. It's more that th- resurrection life means to access all of uh, Christ, all that Christ has done, all who Christ is, all that he has made available to us through his death has been given to us through his conquering of death in the resurrection. So now all life, all godliness, all power, all goodness, every part of God's attributes are available to us. That is what I would describe as resurrection life, full life. And it implies that there's something before the resurrected life. Death. And there's some, he, yes, death, yes. but there was something. But now afterwards, how our lives will expand and deepen because yeah. of this resurrection life. I think life. that's a way to put it. Yeah. It should be a richer, ever growing, ever more wondrous experience of life. And that's something that we're meant to have, is it? Yeah. I mean, we're to, meant to, to have not have that is to short circuit what Christ has done for us. So you're saying it's not just that I get saved, Jesus saved me for this, I don't know, for for eternity. There's something I should be expecting in this world now. Mm. Like my life life. is meant to expand and deepen by means of some kind of like, it implies there's some kind of power in this resurrection life. Yep. Think of this like access to God's tree of life. Oh, what's that? From the... Story of Genesis when they were kicked out of the garden. Well, back to Genesis again. Always back to Genesis. Everything <laughs> comes back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the first few chapters. It all comes back to there. But it also moves forward to the tree of life in Revelation. It's the arc of the story that we have access to life. And um, it's more than just, oh, I get to go to heaven when I die. It's access to being able to partake of all of God's life force that's in that tree through Christ. Anything I need is available to me today through partaking of this resurrection life. So what you said on the previous chapter, if I am to take that resurrection life belief and if I apply it to what you were saying, take God's word and and claim my identity, um, do you know where I'm going with this? Not I yet. Just, okay. Not yet. <laughs> well, what were you saying last chapter? You were saying... We were talking about Abraham and his change of yes, name. Yes, starting to think differently about yes, ourselves. Yes, if we're starting to yep. think differently. And this verse implies that when we start to think differently, there is actually this kind of resurrection power. Yes. This it, life that will help to change that and yes. make it come true, make gotcha. the dreams come something true. Something supernatural. Promises. We access something that isn't in our brain. We access a life source that is available because God is life. And he hooks us up, for want of a better term. If you think of it like a, a hose, a tap, life, this life of God is like a tap through faith in Christ. Every time we do that, we hook up a hose and we turn on the tap and we draw down a life force. I know we've talked to John four a couple of times on this podcast, you and I. It's like Jesus saying, the one who you know, comes to me and drinks of me will never thirst again. It's that same principle. We, are, we have access to a water, a life source that is supernatural, that will have implications for the way we live our lives, but comes initially, not because we've done anything, 
other than believe God and hooked up to his life source. So from what you're saying there, am I right to think that once I hook into this life source, this resurrection life power, I can be made new? Like maybe before I was kind of dead Mm. and maybe now I'm being resurrected into something new in this life? Yep. And I think, I think I know where you're going now. It might be wrong here, but I think he's going to go on. This is where he's going to talk about the difference between the spirit and the flesh. I think he does that later. I think does I'm he? jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead. But, but you is that where you're I'm going? Saying. Yes, yeah. yes, that's yeah. right. We have access to a spiritual life force and we are no longer bound just to live from the natural, fleshly, sinful, fallen life force. It's still there in us, wrestling with us is what he's saying. But the more we connect to Jesus, the more of that life force comes and through the spirit, this is Second Corinthians, I put to death, the, I think, no, it might be in here. I put to death the deeds of the flesh through walking in the spirit, through attaching myself to Jesus. That is, I'll get more of that life and that will kill the life of the flesh. Okay. Anyway. So from what you're saying and what I'm reading here, can I think then that when Jesus had this, or he did this sacrificial death for us, he did more than just cover our sins, to use your word, there's something else going on. Yep. That's what Hebrews says. He took away our sins once for all. There's a resurrection life yep. as well. Yep. We now are hooked into a brand new life. See all the metaphors all mixed in? We were born again by yeah. the spirit. They're all, they're all, all these metaphors are all joined together, explaining different aspects of some cosmic thing that's taken place where we have now been given access to a life force that all humans were originally tried to have, but through sin had squandered. And through Christ's death in our place, sacrificially, we have been reconnected in, regrafted back into that life force. Let's leave it there. Okay. <laughs> and then he, um, if you didn't know what sin was, Paul is going to go back here and tell you a he bit about will. it. He goes back to the story of how Adam landed us, landed us in this dilemma wherein he was the first sin and the first death first death or then death, sorry. Then death fine. First yep. sin, then death, and no one exempt from either sin or death. And that sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone, but the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. Mm -hmm. So he's now going to talk about the, the law. law. Okay. So death created this huge abyss. It separated us from God and it dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. And even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points to the one who will get us out of it. And he starts to make this quite convolute argument. Oh, it's, it's Don't a, you think that you have to spend a lot of time? You have to spend a lot of time. He's talking about first Adam, second Adam. Last Adam. Last Adam, yeah. I always put people on that. He's, he's last Adam. Last Adam. Adam. You're right. You're right. And N.T. Wright says we were in Adam humanity, Adamanity or something. Adamanity. Oh, I like that. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. I think I said it right. Yes. We're Adamanity. Uh, that's Adam very good. Adamanity. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, that's what hum Adam means, human. And then we move into a life of messianess or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Afterwards. That's a well put. I don't remember hearing you ever say that, but that's great. Yeah. Oh, maybe I didn't say no, correctly. No, that, oh, no. That it sounds is. like Adam something Anity. he would say. Yeah. yeah. I've never yeah. heard him say it, but that sounds like something he would say. Yes. And yeah. it's a really good way to put it. He says, yeah. moved from Adamanity to messianess. <laughs> a new type of humanity through Jesus yes. the Messiah. Yes. He says there's two types of humanity. Adamanity, one man who's breaking of God's commandment and brought sin and death. Sin brings, yes. sin brings condemnation. And then the second type, which is the new type through Jesus, the Messiah. Yes. Like it. Very good. Yeah. Yep. And I would go further. I would actually argue that the second type is actually the, the original intention. We are most human when we're in the second type. The, the first type, which we think of as, oh, we're all humans. This is our way humans are, is actually not the original plan. Are you saying we're most human when we're in the resurrection life? Yes, absolutely. We are most human. We are most what we are created to be when we are living in the resurrection life. Okay, wait, wait, wait. But if you're also saying that, if you are saying that, are you also saying that the true human is a person who lives in faith, belief, dreams, trust, grace? Yes, that that was always God's intention, that that's how humans would be. And that is what Christ has done to restore us back to that, which is, here I go again, back to Genesis. Genesis. That's what their job was, to steward the earth, to rule the earth and subdue the earth and represent God in the earth. 
That was the primary goal of humanity, to partner with him in the earth. And we can only do that through Christ. And only when we do that through Christ and live that, that's when we are being what we were called to be in the first place. It's just that it's so rare because what we see is what we call humanity, which is humanity in all of its brokenness. But that wasn't the original plan. I I appreciate you going back to Genesis because it does, I agree with you. It all makes sense when you when you ask look the story at Genesis. back to the beginning. Yep. Yeah, but I might actually think that take it should go one step further, that we were intended, you said we were intended to be that person, but I don't think we could have ever have been the people that God has called us to be without actually realizing what God has done for us Yeah, true. and realizing how valued we are. So we had to almost come through this story to get to that point. We could not have been that person if we didn't go through these su- thousands of sufferings. Of years, well, suffering Tim, Tim Mackey talks of years. about it like we all face the test. Every one of us in every generation will have to face the Garden of Eden test. So Adam and Eve, basically what you just described, Adam and Eve had to go through too. They had to go to that point of, am I going to trust God or am I going to do it myself? Am I going to run my own race or am I going to trust God for it? And we all have to do that. Abraham had to do it. We saw it in the last chapter. We all have to come to that point where we go, I think God has a plan for my life. I have to trust that he will bring it about and he will fulfill true humanity and true uh, fulfillment of what he's called me to be. I'm going to have to trust him with it. And I have a choice. I can go, no, I'm going to trust myself or I'm going to trust God. And that is the, that is the garden of Eden test that every human faces. And even Jesus himself faced that and had to overcome it. And he did. So having said that, let's just quickly sum up here. Why do you think God gave us the law? (laughs) So Paul's saying here, God gave the law to... And the law specifically is is Moses' Moses law. law. Yep. So he's saying here, the the law came to show us, I'm going to use his words. Uh, Where is it? Verse 20, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more and more abundant. More and more abundant. So what God was trying to do in the law was show us how he didn't live up to God's way. It wasn't to show us, hey, if you do this, you will meet up to our standard. It was to actually put structure around it to show the mess that humans were in because we weren't living by this standard. And that in itself would hopefully give us benchmarks to aspire to, but then uh, point us to the fact that we would need a sacrifice. We would need someone to step in that gap and fulfill that law for us. All right. Are you going to say anything else? Nope. What about the idea that that the law, like for example, when it says, do not covet, no matter how hard I try, I am always going to covet. But yeah. I didn't know what coveting was until someone said, it's exactly do exactly not covet. He uses. That, doesn't he say that somewhere in here? Yeah, he does. The law will not say, do not covet. I would know what it was if the law had said, not do, do not covet. That's the point he's trying to make. Maybe it's in the next It could be. Chapter. That's the point he's trying to make. That you, you, The law shows us our sin. It points us to the fact that, oh, this is God's standard. This is where we're coming up short. And you see the two and you go, oh, oh, okay. I'm living by the wrong standard. So it was there to point us to the fact that we are doing something wrong. And no matter how hard we try, we keep falling short of that, don't mm-hmm. we? Yep. So it's almost like no amount of human effort is ever going to get you to live perfectly in the law. That's right. You're always going to stuff up at some point. Correct. And this is what he, remember he's talking to the Jews right at this moment who were relying on their obey, abeyance to the law and he's trying to show them that you were always going to fall short of this. You, that wasn't the purpose of the law. The law wasn't set as a standard to say if you pack, tick all these boxes, then you've been saved. It was to show you that you can't tick all these boxes. You need a saviour. Okay, I'm just going to read this part here from N.T. Wright, and I'm so glad he's part of this podcast. Yes, thank you, N.T. <laughs> because I was actually a little bit lost there when I said the covetousness. Mm-hmm. I was like, is that in this part? He actually says here, I'll just sum it up. But the point Paul was making is that when the Torah, the law, arrived in Israel so far from marking the start of a new type of humanity, it merely intensified the problem of the old type. The law came in alongside so that the trespass might be filled out. And then he says this, which I'm so grateful for. It will actually take Paul half of chapter (laughs) 7 to explain explain what he means. But we can sum it up in advance like this. Uh, Drawing on chapter 5, 13 to 14, as well as the present passage, which we didn't really talk about. Sin in the sense of ordinary human wrongdoing is by itself like a small color slide, a photograph or piece of film by 
a film which by itself you can barely see with the naked eye. Where, what the law does is to put this tiny little thing into a projector with a bright light behind it and a big screen in front of it <laughs> and the, the law draws attention to sin but by itself it's powerless to do anything about stopping it. Ah, uh, he's the king of metaphors. Yes. That's so good. It is good, yeah. So what it did is it put a... Put, it, put the little sin that we can't really see up on a big screen for us to make it really obvious hey, how far short you're falling. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's good. And I'm glad I have it there because I was just going to ramble on something. No, but I can skip ahead That's now. great. Very good. So here, just to sum up this last bit here, if death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, Adam, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting, everything right, that the one man Jesus Christ provides? Yeah. I love the whole how much more mentality. I use it a lot that because I feel like sin has this hold on me and wants to pull me down. But uh, Paul is arguing, you know, you feel that sin trying to pull you down, but in Christ there is a, a much more power pulling you up out yeah. of that. You have access to yeah. a life force that is so much more rich and infinitely powerful than that sin that's before you that seems to be tugging at you to pull you back down again. I like that you say that because I want to believe in that because I am so set in my old sinful way. Mm. I can feel the tug of sin yep, that do. has such a stronghold on me that I find it hard to believe that the pull of Christ to upwards life is stronger than what I already live mm. in. Yep. But – it is. It's meant to be. That's it what is it says. meant to be. That's what it says. Yeah. That was one of the most powerful revelations of my life. I haven't always lived it out, but it has been one that I've gone to when I felt this temptation towards sin or anger or whatever, you know, pick, pick a sin of choice. It, and I feel like I'm overwhelmed or can't help myself is to have just stepped into faith, which is what we've been talking about and trusting in God's promise and going to God's word says, I have access to a life force that's stronger and defeats that, that power of that sin and that death in my life. And not to try to reason it or focus on it, but accept that. And I have found that to do that, to plug into Jesus at those times, it changes or diminishes the power of that sin. Paul would say, I put to death sin, the flesh, through the spirit. So what I'm doing is I'm accessing this spirit life and it does the work to defeat the flesh life in me rather than me trying to defeat the flesh life through the flesh life. So has that changed you? It has changed me. I think it's something I go to often when I'm feeling anger or whatever, you know, justified in my, any, any sinful attitude, I feel. It does change it. It reminds me that I'm, I'm accessing something that is greater than me. And every time you do that, does the understanding of that power get bigger in your life? Yeah, I think like so. You... Yeah, so I'm not perfect at it. Still have my moments. But I, I, I know that the trajectory of my life since that revelation has been, there are countless times where it's gotten me off a pathway of sinful destructiveness much earlier that's prevented a lot of heartache because I've drawn on, God, I can't do this, I, I, this power flesh. And we're going to see it in Romans 7. Paul says, you know, what a wretched man I am. I'm trying to wrestle with my own sinful nature. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be God to God through Jesus Christ. So he's had that same revelation too. It has made it easier, not perfect, but it has made it easier to draw on something other than myself to overcome my sinful desires. So in your understanding of God, is he a big, powerful God? Yeah, especially in this context. Yeah. Because I know that Bono says in a line, I may have even said it on this podcast because I think about it a lot. He says in a song, the God I believe in isn't short of cash, mister. Yeah, I've heard him say yeah. that before. I've heard you say that before too. <laughs> I do yeah, think I've about it too much. Heard, yeah. So. The God you believe in, what's he not short of? What's he not short of? Yeah. Um, lit, for the sake of shortening it down, I think it's this resurrection life. He's not short of anything I need for that pertains to life and godliness, to use what Peter says in the New Testament. God gives me all that I need into pertaining to life and godliness. So anything I need to help me to live his way, he has for me. There's never any shortage of that. That's much more than just personal salvation. Oh, Do you realize that? What yeah. you just said? <laughs> yeah, it's rich pertaining to life and godliness. Well, godliness is a communal concept. It's the way I interact with those around me. To be godly is to interact in such a way that I represent God. That comes from him. It doesn't come from me being a good person or trying to be a good person. That comes from me accessing a life source that changes me at a fundamental core identity level so that what comes out of me 
over time is less flesh, more spirit. So how do I access your life source? Your you, God sounds a lot bigger and better than mine. You don't access it through me. You access it directly through Jesus all right. by accepting and doing all the things that Abraham had to do, accepting it in faith, trusting God, calling yourself something different, spending time with him and and spending time in community. That's what he's Paul's trying to say. The more you spend time in community, the more opportunities you'll have. <laughs> the more opportunities you'll have to be tempted to be respond in the flesh. But as you plug into Jesus, the more you will over time become like him. And should and I? I look back forward and think, I've got so far to go, but I'm not where I was, but I'm not there yet. You're on a journey. We're all on a journey. Yeah. So should I dare to believe? Yeah. Come on. Come dare on, to folks. believe that on, he's Jeannie. bigger than. Believe that he's bigger than the problems, bigger than the sins, bigger than the things that seem all encompassing. To dare to believe that I am Abraham, not Abram. Yeah. I love it. Exactly. Yep. So we can do it. What we can happen? rejoice too yeah. when we run into problems and trials for we know that they develop endurance. That's the point. And it can, he continues that saying, grace because God is putting together everything again, putting everything together again through the Messiah invites us into a life, a life that goes on and on and on and on and on without end. And he's beginning to introduce a cosmic thing here. A cosmic thing. The, 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 the grace we've been entered into is bigger than just us. Bigger than just us. Dare to believe. Believe, trust, dream. Speak it, declare it over your life. Yep, grace. Oh, how rich. Yeah. How rich is this stuff? This is is Romans, folks. It is deep, rich stuff. It could be life-changing. Yeah, it could be indeed. That's why people have called it what we started yesterday's episode with. It could. The greatest of all the texts, the most important of all of them. It could actually unlock the dead life. And make it new. Yes, it can yes. indeed. Yes, spend time. The, the next chapter is when death becomes life, and that's a really interesting idea because, as far as I'm concerned, when something's dead, it's dead, dead. Right. You know what I mean? Dead, dead. So yeah. I'm interested to hear how dead. you tell me that life comes from dead, dead into life. Okay, let's do it. Let's go there. Okay. Talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bible. Wait. What? Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also find us on all the socials. Just search The Bible. Wait, what? And to find out more about our church, just search C3 Camden, C3 Picton, or C3 Thoreau on the web or on the socials. Thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of The Bible. Wait, what?